You're still going strong. Still right there, yeah. We're good. So how many people are in the crossing there? Um, it's like it's like five people actually in the course, but then there's others. There's a bunch of people that come and do the workshops with us and like follow up. Yeah, so it's been very well received. Let's do this one more time. So I'm going to give a lecture on uh, phylogenetic methods. And uh, it, it's just one of those topics that um, you know, I decided to include in the course. But also, every year when I teach the course, I always wonder, well, you know, should I be giving a lecture on something else? Uh, maybe not all of you use phylogenetic methods. <clears throat> but anyway, those are the kinds of uh, questions that you can pass opinion on if you um, uh, if you go and uh, do the course evaluation, because I'm interested in your thoughts about things like that, whether we should spend more time on some topics and then kick out multivariate or, or whatever. Ideas like that are useful to me. <clears throat> but today, anyway, I'm going to talk about the problem of using species as data points and give you an idea, an intuition for uh, why this topic has generated so much discussion and the development of so many methods. And uh, one of the reasons why it, it, this has um, yeah, generated a lot of discussion and development of methods is that a lot of what we know about in biology is based on comparisons between species. And uh, so the question often arises, well, how, how reliable are the kinds of comparisons that we typically make or, or used to make when we know that um, species aren't independent, and that's because they are related to varying degrees because of phylogenetic history. And uh, people used to, you know, ask questions like, uh, you know, how is uh, testes size related to mating system? A lot of our knowledge about that would be based on comparisons between species, but how do we do those comparisons when um, we know about this problem of non-independence? And uh, the, the, I guess the methodology sort of started to erupt in the 1980s as people started to raise this question and, uh, uh, and whether we could come up with methods that, that would help us. So I'm going to start with a, a trial, sort of random data set uh, that I got from uh, Locke Rowe and uh, Euron Arnqvist. So just to um, give an example of the kinds of studies that are used, um, uh, for, for which species data are used to try and draw generalizations about what's happening in, in uh, real systems in nature. 
So it's an examination of uh, associations between different aspects of mating in water striders. So here's how water striders mate. Males chase females. So they all, they all live on the water surface. And um, uh, females avoid this by, by skating away. And if you've ever watched a, a collection, a population, a cluster of water striders, they spend a lot of time doing this. And then males uh, will um, grab a female, and that will typically initiate a series of leaps and, and rolls and, and you know, flips and somersaults that usually toss the male off. Um, <clears throat> males of some species have evolved traits, modified antennas, claspers, uh, uh, clasping genitalia that uh, seem to allow them to stay on longer. If you surgically manipulate those, um, those traits, you find that they're, that they're easier to flip, easier to toss off. Uh, and uh, in some of these species where males have appendages that appear to adapt them to hanging on, uh, females often have devices or spines that make it even more difficult for males to hang on. Anyway, this is what passes for a mating system in water striders. But mating does, uh, when it does take place, it's usually be because a female stops attempting to toss the male off. So some of the variables that were measured as part of this study to investigate sort of the co-evolution of males and, and females were things like average duration of female struggles and average mating frequency. So those are the two variables that I'm going to compare. Is there an association? So that would be a, a thing that one would typically investigate, uh, the kinds of variables that one would typically investigate in, in comparing species to try to learn something about the, um, the basis of the mating system, basis of variation between species and their behaviors. Okay, so here's 15 species of water striders. And uh, the y-axis is female mating frequency. How often do females mate? And along the y-axis is average struggle duration. And the there seems to be a correlation between these variables, from which we might be able to draw some conclusions about how one variable might affect the evolution of the other. How strong is this correlation? Is the correlation real? How do we approach that problem when species are data points? So, as I said, um, species data aren't independent. And uh, the reason they are is because they're related to varying degrees by descent. So this is a phylogenetic tree, we saw one in the presentation today, and uh, we've seen in more than one um, reading the idea that species occur at tips of phylogenetic trees. And here it's fairly clear that some species are very closely related and others more distantly related. These branch lengths refer to time, and the relationship between any two species is really based on uh, um, the, uh, the branching pattern of the tree. So these two are closely related, whereas this species and this species more distantly related. What we can see in this example <coughs> is something that's frequently seen when one uh, compares um, species that are related to varying degrees by descent. And that is that closely related species often tend to have similar trait values. So there's an example of three species whose average uh, struggle duration is almost the same. Should they be counted three times in the comparison? Uh, cross species, or should those three species, essentially because they're all so closely related, be counted just once? How do we somehow accommodate um, this similarity that we see between closely related species? So there's another um, example of closely related species being uh, similar in their trait values. So this tendency for closely related species to um, be similar in their trait values is uh, what's often referred to in the literature as phylogenetic signal. So low phylogenetic signal means species are all over the place and similarity and uh, relatedness doesn't predict similarity in trait values. Whereas high phylogenetic signal means that relatedness does predict uh, relatedness, uh, that relatedness does predict um, similarity of trait values. Non-independence of species data points violates a major assumption of all of the conventional statistical methods that we use. We assume that whenever we do an association or a hypothesis test, we are 
that, that our uh, data points are all randomly sampled from a population. Every species or every data point has an equal probability of being sampled and, uh, uh, and uh, um, the values of one species in no way affect the values of, uh, sorry, not one data point, in no way affect the value that you get uh, for another data point. But this is violated in the case of um, when species are the data points because of phylogeny. So how bad is the problem really? Um, so um, Freckleton and Al did a survey of um, data in the published literature that was available at that time, and they used a measure called Pagel's lambda to uh, quantify phylogenetic signal in uh, trees and traits. So Pagel's lambda is uh, close to one if there's strong phylogenetic signal. In other words, cluster related species tend to be more similar in their trait values. Whereas uh, Pagel's lambda would be low if um, phylogenetic signal is low. And what the graph shows is that most examples have at least some phylogenetic signal. And that the class with the highest degree, uh, or the, the value of Pagel's lambda, um, that is most frequent of all, is uh, very high phylogenetic signal. So it does seem to be an issue in real traits, um, real phylogenies in nature. <clears throat> Why is phylogenetic signal a problem? So non-independence in any context uh, leads to wrong calculations of precision, standard errors, confidence intervals. And uh, when hypothesis testing, it leads to wrong uh, type 1 error rates. So basically, everything is wrong. All of the methods that we use in the uh, conventional data analysis can be thrown off if phylogenetic signal is present. Felsenstein, in his um, 1985 paper, presented a solution, but he also painted the following scenario to illustrate why phylogenetic signal is uh, a problem. So, uh, Felsenstein, 1985, is, uh, I think, the, uh, the most cited paper in the history of the journal The American Naturalist. So this was a paper that really broke new ground and has been cited and is still frequently cited. Uh, and that's because it solved this problem to a large extent, at least for certain kinds of traits. So here's Felsenstein's phylogeny, example phylogeny, which he called the worst case scenario. And he, he drew this just to, to uh, um, make the point. Imagine we have a phylogeny of 40 species, and their relationships look like this. And there's sort of two, one, one sort of deep branch, and then uh, a whole pile of virtually simultaneous um, subsequent branches in uh, two groups. If you looked at two measurements made on this group of species, you might find, for example, that the two traits, X and Y, are correlated. But under the worst case scenario that uh, Felsenstein painted, he showed that all you need to produce this association is a single um, transition in which a change in X happens in the same direction as a change in Y, and then totally random, non-correlated evolution for the rest of evolutionary history would produce a pattern, uh, as I showed you, of a positive correlation between but when um, you use different symbols to show the two groups, you recognize that within each of the groups, there is absolutely no association between X and Y. And there's only one data point, really, that is the cause of the apparent correlation between X and Y, and that's the very first split in this uh, worst-case scenario phylogeny. So with that example, Felsenstein made it clear that um, we can't count every species as an independent uh, observation that we test for associations between variables or measure the strengths of those um, associations with, uh, 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 with measurements of precision like standard errors. I guess that was the worst case scenario. And not all um, scenarios correspond to the worst case, but nevertheless, whenever we 
carry out ordinary statistics on a group of species, we are making the assumption that the phylogeny actually looks like this. That all species are equally related to one another. And that assumption is violated by just about every phylogenetic tree you or I have ever looked at. All right, so the assumption of conventional statistics is a star phylogeny. Basically, no history, no varying degrees of uh, relatedness among the species. So they all basically erupted from uh, an explosion uh, on simultaneously and have been evolving them independently ever since. So Felsenstein um, came up with a very simple solution, and that was, let's make an assumption, and that assumption we'll call um, Brownian motion. Let's imagine that the evolution of both traits, X and Y, can be mimicked by a random walk in time. So we've already encountered the idea of a random walk, and uh, the idea is really that um, at every time step, um, a uh, uh, the, the measurement of a variable can change. It can go uh, left, it can go right, it can stay right where it is. There's, uh, in fact, a normal distribution of outcomes under Brownian motion um, uh, between two time steps. And uh, as those time steps accumulate over time, the expectation is that, uh, on average, the difference between uh, two species will ha uh, have the expectation of a normal distribution with a variance that's proportional to the time since their common ancestor. So that's what Brownian motion assumption means, and the assumption of a, a continuous random walk. Um, it doesn't mean that the populations are evolving according to random genetic drift. It just means that Populations are evolving. We don't know why or, 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 or how. All we need is the, to assume that it can be mimicked by a, a continuous random one. Felstein pointed out that if this is true, then um, the two species A, or the three species A, B, and C are not independent, because A and B share a more recent common ancestor. However, the difference between A and B is independent of the difference between C and the average of A and B. So those he called contrasts. And for N species, there are N uh, minus one independent contrasts. So under the assumption of Brownian motion, uh, you can actually extract observational data from a phylogenetic tree by using the contrasts instead of the species measurements themselves. So uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, but to give you a little bit of intuition for um, how these contrasts are calculated. They're calculated with two things in mind. The first is the, uh, the structure of the tree itself, the idea that um, you know, this difference between A and B is different from the, uh, is independent of the difference between C and the average of A and B. But in order to compare all of the contrasts across the entire um, phylogeny, they have to be standardized so that uh, they're all on the same scale, they all have the same expected variance. <coughs> And uh, so um, it's assumed that in this case that the variance is proportional to branch length, which is usually time. Okay, and this just sort of shows a cartoon of how you would calculate uh, a contrast in a tree that looked like this. So the first contrast would be uh, the difference between A and B. If you were going to then calculate the second contrast, C versus A and B, you'd have to take into account all of the branch lengths. In computing the contrast because the species are weighted according to the branch length that subtends them. Okay. And the variance of the contrast itself is proportional again to the, uh, the branch lengths. And so when calculating the correlation, you standardize by those expected variances. So that's, that's the most I'm going to say about the 
calculation details. <clears throat> so this method that Felsenstein um, invented, he called phylogenetically independent contrasts. And his idea was then to convert the data on both traits to their independent contrasts using the phylogeny of the species, and then calculate the correlation between the independent contrasts of the two traits. And if the running motion assumption is correct, you're fine. You've solved the problem of uh, uh, non-independence. So here's a, a cutaway from the uh, water strider phylogeny, and uh, uh, three potential contrasts. One is the difference between these two species. Another, the difference between these two and the average of those, and the difference between uh, 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 this species, the contrast between this species and the average of uh, this and this. Okay, so four species, three contrasts. And here are the measurements from that study that were made on the four um, species for the two traits, struggle duration and mating rate. And so to calculate the contrast, uh, you would say take 16 minus 10 to calculate the contrast between these two species, and then 0.32 minus 0.33. It's totally arbitrary whether you go 16 by 10, minus 10, or whether you go 10 minus 16, as long as you do it the same way for both of the traits. That's fairly intuitive. And then all the uh, contrasts. Uh, are plotted as before, and uh, you test the association between the two variables, um, not using the species data themselves, but using the contrasts instead. And um, because the, um, the direction is arbitrary as to uh, how you calculate the difference in each contrast, the um, relationship, the linear relationship describing the association between these two species goes through the origin, zero, zero. And so that's why you get exactly the same answer if this one is measured as, you know, minus 6, minus 0.5, or plus 6, plus 0.5. Okay. Um, forcing the relationship through the origin fixes the consequences of the direction being arbitrary. So in this case, the correlation was positive. Um, I'm going to reiterate some of the assumptions, which I pointed out already, the, the, the biggie, which is that Brownian motion, that evolution truly is mimicked by uh, a random walk in time. And what that means is that the rate of evolution doesn't change through the history of this lineage. So Brownian motion means that the rate is always the same. It's the same on all branches of the tree. It's, uh, it's the same through time. It also assumes that um, you know, the probability of a split or the probability of an extinction um, before you get your species and um, uh, can create the phylogeny based on those that uh, made it to the present time, that those are independent of the trait values as well. All of these assumptions are difficult to verify. So that is still, a, uh, I guess, probably the major concern in the application of these methods is trying to make sure that the assumptions are met to a reasonable degree. If, for example, the rate of evolution changes through time, it's possible to accommodate that by some kind of a transformation that weights deeper branches differently than more recent branches. So there are methods that handle that. Harvey and Rambo did a whole series of simulations making different assumptions about models of evolution. And they showed that in extreme cases, that using independent contrasts can be worse than just using the species data points as far as type 1 error rates are, are concerned. So, but, but they had to push the system to, to get uh, um, you know, evolutionary models that were substantially different from Brownian motion in order to reach this extreme conclusion, which is that forget about the contrast, uh, use the species values instead. My experience in the literature is that people always do both, anyway. Not only that, the, uh, the uh, results are usually similar between doing one 
Although the standard errors aren't necessarily the same width. I want to tell you about a related method that uses um, linear models. It's called uh, general least squares. So it's an extension of the linear model methods that we already uh, came to know and love as part of this course. And uh, the, the reason this particular method is cool is that um, it turns out to be mathematically equivalent to phylogenetically independent contrasts. But it's a linear model. So, so you can do it yourself. And also, there's such a, there's such a rich framework for um, available already for linear models. Calculating likelihoods, model selection, all this, all this, uh, um, the structure, all this methodology is sort of built into um, methods like LM and uh, LME. So, so being able to calculate the equivalent of phylogenetically independent contrast using a linear model approach is what's considered an advance. An advance. Alan Graffin was the person to point this out. So general um, least squares is like an ordinary linear model. But it assumes that the residuals are correlated, they do not have equal variance. So if you'll remember, uh, the assumptions of LM are that the residuals are independent and that they have equal variance. So general least squares takes that assumption and, and liberates you from that assumption. In the case where you actually know what the error structure is of the residuals and how the, they differ in their variances, and it's phylogeny. Under a Brownian motion assumption, phylogeny provides that uh, in this context. So the way the method works is that it's like linear models in general, but it weights the data points um, according to uh, a covariance matrix between all pairs of points. And uh, the weight matrix for a tree that looks like this uh, would be um, calculated as follows. So if the Brownian motion assumption is correct, then the expected covariance between any two species is the proportion of total history that they share from the root to the tip. And so the expected covariance between, say, Achilles and Homo <coughs> would be the branch link shared between Achilles and Homo, which is this part of the tree, which, is, which has the value 0.38. And that's true for uh, Achilles versus uh, um, all uh, these other three um, species. So the covariance matrix would be structured like this. So along the diagonal is the, essentially the covariance between every species and itself, which is just one. And then these are... Um, basically counts of the proportion of, the, of, of history that is shared. So uh, there's no shared history between Galago and any of the others. And then uh, all the other uh, um, numbers come from uh, the, uh, the branch length shared. So Pongo and Homo uh, share you know, this plus this plus this. So they share a considerable um, fraction of the total tree. Uh, is shared between those two species, and so those would be expected to have a very high degree of covariance. We expect, the, therefore, that the traits would be highly, more highly similar between those two species than between, say, Homo and Galico. Anyway, so these expected covariances are used as weights, essentially, in the fitting of a linear model. And in effect, species that share a great deal of their evolutionary history are, are downweighted. It's almost like these two species are not counted as fully two, but they're counted a, a, a bit less. They're downweighted because of the history that they share. In the same way, I guess, that ED in the reading this week downgrades species uh, uh, scores if they um, share their history with a, a lot of other species. Um, the assumptions are the same as before. Brownian motion is the, is the assumption. 
But uh, general least squares is more flexible than uh, independent contrast because it can handle more complicated phylogenetic models of trait evolution, not just Brownian motion. So there are uh, one um, method that we encountered earlier in the um, model selection uh, lecture was, um, you know, this sort of adaptive peak model of evolution in contrast to the Brownian motion model. So those were two models that were compared uh, to data on a fossil sequence. And uh, generally squares can incorporate these others, these other models of evolution by um, basically using a different way of calculating their covariances. So other models of evolution can be incorporated. All you need to know is how they, have, they determine the expected covariances between the of species. And uh, the package GLS in NLME is, uh, can be used to fit phylogenetic linear models. So it's already a tool in a package you have some familiarity with. And uh, in R, there's a package called APE, which uh, in fact does GLS as well by calling NLME. And it will also do the um, phylogenetically independent contrast. Um, a linear model approach, as I said, makes it easy to use transformations or, or to fit other models. And some of these sort of ad hoc models uh, that are used involve transformation of branch lengths to better meet the assumption of Brownian motion. So if the rate of evolution through time is not constant, um, often the assumptions of Brownian motion can be better met by transforming branch lengths using Pagel's lambda. Okay, and so in, in this way, uh, we can fit data in which the phylogenetic signal is not as strong as you would expect from shared phylogenetic history, but might be weaker for reasons that we do not necessarily need to understand, but that by doing so allow us to mimic the Brownian motion process better. And uh, we'll do this in the workshop this week as well. The eighth package in R will find uh, an estimate of Pagel's lambda that best fits the data on the phylogenetic tree. And then that lambda can be incorporated into the linear model to test a correlation or estimate a correlation between variables using species as data points. I'm going to show uh, another example, but this one is for discrete traits. So again, discrete traits uh, also have the potential problem that the measurements obtained on species are not independent, that we expect in general closely related species to be more similar in their traits than more distantly related species. Uh, so the example is from uh, lilies. I didn't know this until I read this uh, paper. I should have noticed it, but uh, the, the, the observation is that um, lilies that flower in low light environments of the forest understory, uh, such as this lily here, tend to have small and inconspicuous flowers. Whereas the uh, lilies that have these big showy flowers tend to live out in the open, or they tend to flower in deciduous woodlands before the trees have uh, leafed out. So there's still lots of light hitting the forest floor. That seems to be the pattern. And um, here's uh, data on 17 lily species which seem to suggest that indeed um, there is an association. So the two traits that are being associated in this example are whether flowers are showy or inconspicuous. So the, the, the trait showy versus inconspicuous is basically being grouped into two discrete categories. And then whether they, uh, the species live in open habitats uh, or shaded habitats. And based on this contingency table, it looks like a very strong association. You know, all but one showy uh, all but one species living in open habitat is showy, and every species li uh, living in shaded habitat uh, has inconspicuous flowers. But the association is stronger than, appears to be stronger than it really is, and that, that's because when you look at the phylogenetic relationships between the species, you, really, that you realize that not many evolutionary events have probably occurred, not many transitions between open and shaded habitat have occurred in the history of the, the lily clade, and uh, not many transitions from um, 
uh, you know, inconspicuous to show it have occurred in the in the uh, uh, the clay either. So this attempts to show graphically, first of all, the tree of relationship between the species. And uh, a dark background means the species occur in shade, whereas a white background means they live in the open. And then yellow means they're showy, like a tiger lily, and green means they're inconspicuous. So sure enough, there is an association between the two. <clears throat> um, but uh, now th these sort of transitions are, as, are, are not known for certain either, and so in this graph they're really just um, guessed at to, uh, for, for the purpose of making the point. Hey, did you say that these lilies here, they're exclusively found in open habitats versus shaded habitats, or are there, there's no... Um, so for this particular study, uh, all shades of gray were eliminated, and the species were classified as primarily one or primarily the other. Okay, but they do. Are you telling me that I don't have my lizard, my lily facts correct? <laughs> well, what about that one know. right there? What's that? Cardiogram. It's a showy flower growing in the shade. Exactly. So that would represent a, that, that was the one outlier in the yeah. contingency table, I think. But the fact is this is fairly closely related to, fairly closely related to uh, the, uh, a group of um, showy flower species living in open habitats. So as I said, where these transition occur is highly uncertain. That has to be taken into account. <clears throat> um, but uh, you can see that not very many evolutionary events are needed to explain the association between uh, uh, habitat and flower uh, phenotype in this example. And so rather than have 17 species, maybe we just have like three events? Is that how many data points we should have? Three instead of 17? So that's the that's kind of the conundrum. So Mark Pagel uh, uh, developed a method to um, analyze data for discrete characters, and I think his paper. Someone told me once that his '94 paper, which was in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, is the most cited publication ever in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. So. Hard to believe. Surely Newton published in the philosophical world. But maybe this century or last century. I don't know. Uh, anyway, I, I mentioned that just to indicate how popular these methods are, how useful these methods have become, and how you know, they, they build a, a need that people have already perceived. So for discrete characters, Pagel's method assumes once again that um, traits evolve according to a random walk. So for continuous traits, it's a, the, the process is a continuous random walk called the um, Brownian motion. For discrete traits, it's a discrete random walk uh, in time that's described by a random walk for discrete traits called the Markov process. And the concept is the same. And the method, what it tries to do is estimate the rate at which transitions occur through time from one state to the other, and this shows an estimate for uh, just a single trait. And then it uses uh, likelihood to test how a transition between states in one of the traits is associated through time with transitions uh, in state in the other trait, like habitat. And I'm not going to go into details other than to say, basically, it just tests for correlated uh, correlated evolution through time, when um, uh, character evolution is mimicked by a discrete random walk in time, a Markov process. And to point out that there's, a, there's, a, there's an app for that in our... So one last uh, uh, thing that I wanted to mention is that uh, clouds have appeared over the horizon. And there were a number of indications of this um, over, um, over time that, uh, that there might be a problem with the Pagel's metric. And um, uh, people showed that it's possible to get a significant result using Pagel's method, uh, even with only a single transition in both of the traits, as long as they happened along you know, the same, at around the same time. <coughs> 
that a, a single instance of a change, say, uh, between showy and inconspicuous, and between shaded and, and uh, uh, open habitat, with sufficiently many species, can produce a statistically significant association. And so people began to realize that the assumptions of Pagel's um, test essentially amounts to uh, pseudo-replication. So the, the precise reasons why this emerges, I won't discuss. I'm not sure I fully understand them. Pagel's meta, a random walk in time basically assumes that every time point gives you an independent piece of information about whether the traits are changing together or not. And not changing at all together is considered just as much evidence as changing together in Pagel's method. And the evolutionary biologists, sensible evolutionary biologists, think that, that maybe there's something wrong with that. And uh, that's what produces this uh, property that Madison and Fitzjohn called within claim pseudo replication. I wonder if it goes back and forth. Does it count for that? So if it evolves, if it evolves something and then, or like a whale, um, or they came out of the water onto land and then they went back into the water. I didn't know that. So, but your your question is about you know like what do we focus on repetition? Yes. And We're reversals. Redund redundancy. To reversals. See, yeah. Exactly. To see repeated instances in which. Is that the issue there? Right. So, um, the whole idea behind Felsenstein's um, independent contrast method. It, the, re the advantage that the contrast method has over the general least squares is that it's really making the point that the only way you would ever see an association between two variables is if they happen repeatedly in the same direction. That each contrast, or that uh, across the tree, that uh, you know, the, the majority of the contrasts are, are showing that whenever you get a change in one, it's associated with a change in the other. So Pagel's method doesn't really do that. And, and my understanding of one of the reasons why Hegel's method is, it turns out to be um, um, you know, not robust, is that it also kind of measures the number of times in which neither of the traits change at all and considers that uh, data. <clears throat> so I should point out that um, there is no solution yet to this problem. But um, clever minds are working on it. Um, but it did raise the question, all the discussion about um, Pagel's method and uh, potential solutions then has sort of raised in some people's minds the question of whether biogenically independent contrasts actually might also um, be susceptible. So as I said, it was pointed out with Pagel's method that, uh, you know, like a single transition along the same branch in both of the two characters, habitat and showiness, uh, with sufficiently many species could produce this statistically significant result. And the question is, can this happen in the, uh, with the method of independent contrast? And the answer is actually yes. Um, it is possible for a single extraordinary event in which there is, you know, a big change in both of two characters can um, can produce a statistically significant, apparently a statistically significant association. But it would also produce an outlier that would be noticeable in a plot of phylogenetically independent contrasts. And any outlier is immediately uh, an indication that the assumption of Brownian motion has been violated. So there might be a kind of a self-correcting um, procedure, just ordinary diagnostics might be sufficiently um, incorporated into the method itself that it is unlikely to be misled. Um, but, and, and that's again in, in part because, especially when, when you do it with um, independent contrast, that it, it you're, the only way you can ever get a correlation is if the association, is, the, the contrast in one trait and the contrast in another trait, point in the same direction over and over and over again. It counts the contrasts, not the non-shifts. However, um, as John and Madison say, 
we need to be aware that comparative methods detecting associations between continuous variables could in principle be susceptible. Any comparative method that responds to the effect of a state rather than the effect of a change in state uh, will be susceptible to uh, within claim pseudo replication. And um, this is the one concern I have in using the general least squares method, and that is that the, there's no canned method to, to actually do the diagnostics, to see if the assumptions of normal errors and that there are no outliers and stuff like that are, uh, the, the assumptions met. So the independent contrast method has that um, advantage. So again, computers do it both. R does it both. R does more than just both those ways of analyzing continuous variables. R has a, a um, what, what I'm going to show you is what in R is called a task view. And uh, um, so the, the site that you go to, CRAN, is, is where you download um, uh, R to, to begin with. And not only are all the packages there that you download and install on your computer, there are also these pages created by people, in this case Brian O'Meara, called task views. And what they do is they describe all of the contributed packages that are available in R for a particular kind of analysis. So I, uh, I had a look at this uh, task view for file genetics, especially comparative methods, uh, last night. And I want to show you just uh, every contributed package on this uh, page is um, indicated in blue so that you can get an idea of where the, the explanatory text is and where the, uh, the actual package is identified. So they talk about ink, which is uh, a very versatile package that um, I even used it and will use it in the workshop um, this week. So there are a whole lot of other packages available that will do related methods and some of them are not available in eight. And these are methods for um, yeah, getting trees into R, utility functions, ancestor state reconstruction, uh, analyses of diversification, so whether traits uh, or whether certain um, parts of the tree you know, have more speciation events than other parts of the tree. Estimating divergence times, estimating phylogenies themselves in the first place. Simulations of trees, simulations of trait, and analysis of trait evolution on trees. Uh, trait simulations, tree manipulation packages, tree plotting packages, uh, sort of uh, uh, programs that connect uh, phylogenies with phylogeographies, microbial ecology methods that, that make use of phylogenetic methods. Phyloclimatic modeling, I've never heard of that. Uh, so that's it, a mirror, a mirror, whatever, six pages, to give you an idea of all the tools that are available in this package. And there's going to be a workshop on comparative methods on Thursday. So join me in giving those, um, giving those methods a try. Um, yeah, this is my last slide, it's the last lecture, so I thought I would reiterate a couple of things. And that is, uh, maybe this course has persuaded you that as soon as you get the chance, you will abandon R and go back to uh, uh, the, the other methods that have these nice drop-down menus and, and, uh, and selection of choices. But at least I, I've given you an idea of the versatility of this program and um, how that can enable a lot of, not just analyses, but also ways of thinking about data that um, might not have been familiar to you and would have been difficult to, um, to teach if there was not a tool readily available. If you abandon R, at least be demanding of the package that you do uh, uh, choose in the future. And because um, it has uh, a lot to answer for, if it can't do a lot of the things that we've already made use of with this um, package. So as I, said, I said at the beginning, the, this course was really just an introduction to um, a lot of the methods that are used today in analyzing um, biological data, data especially in uh, ecology and evolution.
and that at this point you might not feel that you have firm command of every one of those methods. Um, but that's okay. My aim, I mean, there's really two ways to teach this course. One is to, you know, focus on linear models for a whole term, and then you'll understand it well. But the other is to, you know, at the, at the risk of being superficial, cover at least uh, the concepts that, um, that are important in, in thinking about ways to analyze the data, it give you a chance to at least dip your toes in and then, you know, your graduate students, leave it to you to decide what methods work for you and then maybe investigate them more, more deeply yourself. And with all of these other students sitting around this table who are also going to be around for uh, a little while and, uh, uh, and will continue to uh, help you and uh, you can help them progress in, in, uh, in, in thinking about data and using this um, marvelous tool. So I'll keep the RTIPS website online and the workshops are online and so you can keep coming back and if you suddenly decide you need to do model selection or whatever, you can go back and at least practice it again before you unleash it upon your, um, uh, your own data. Refresh your, your mind. A lot of people in the Biodiversity Center and uh, um, people connected to the Biodiversity Center use R for data analysis so there is lots of help and then you've already you know, realize that Google is also uh, your friend. It's amazing how much information is out there. It's amazing to me how many people ask questions, and, and it's amazing, even more amazing to me, how people have time to answer them and often, <laughs> often do a very good job. I've learned a lot about R using, um, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, sites, like cross-validation is, is one that uh, I have found to be useful. So anyway, uh, you're on your own. See ya. But um, come to the, come to the uh, workshop on Thursday to try some of these phylogenetic methods to, to get a sense of how they work and, and uh, get you thinking about why species data are different and, and, and the idea that there are some tools available for, uh, for taking account of phylogeny and making progress. I had a friend who was in statistics and part of their, um, some of their assignments were to answer questions on that exchange and that kind of stuff. So that might be why. Say that, say that again. I had a friend in statistics, and uh, some of their assignments were answering questions on the internet like that. And they no, that's a really good one. idea. That's a really good idea. Yeah. My daughter's in psychology. You can't graduate in, in psychology unless you volunteer for various experiments. And, uh, and uh, uh, that may, like, that's also really good. I like the idea that you can't graduate or whatever until you help a lot of other people. Good. We don't do that in, in uh, psychology and evolution. But anyway, we help each other. Any any questions? <laughs> if you have them, I'll, I'll, I'll still have uh, my office hours this afternoon. So I said there's no exam for the course. I know that I'm expecting something from you this Friday. So carry on. Keep using R at least until Friday. <laughs> I'll certainly be around. What's that? It's a ten doll. My pleasure. Stop harassing. <laughs> it must be awful to be a water striker. Are there any samples where. Yeah. What's that? Are there any samples like non plant species where it's like not a major tool? I think, I think, I think we've aphids reproduce clonally over. It's, like, it's psychological. Over the summers, uh, aphids. Reproduce clonally. What was that? A lot of things can do both. But uh, like, very few things choose, like give up on sexual reproduction entirely. But almost all that do 
uh, are closely related to sexual ancestry. Yeah, well, there's like a filtration. But for the striders, it seems like the filter is both the female's ability to fight them off and the male's ability to pursue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's basically the main system of water striders. Yeah. Chase, well, they're ruined for me now. I used to love those creatures. Now, like, I'm going to know what they're doing. <laughs>